Another incredibly surprisingly difficult problem is the Collatz conjecture. Oh, yes. Simple to state, mm -hmm. beautiful to visualize yes. in its simplicity, and yet extremely uh, difficult to solve, and yet you have been able to make progress. Uh, uh, Paul Erdar said about the Collatz conjecture that mathematics may not be ready for such problems. Mm -hmm. Others have stated that it is an extraordinarily difficult problem, completely out of reach, this is in 2010, out of reach of present day mathematics, and yet yeah. you have made some progress. Why is it so difficult to make? Can you actually even explain what it is? It's oh yeah, yeah. To... so it's, it's, a, it's a problem that you can explain um, yeah, it it, um, it helps with some um, visual aids, but yeah. So you take any natural number, like say thirteen, and you apply the following procedure to it. So if it's even, you divide it by two, and if it's odd, you multiply it by three and add one. So even numbers get smaller, odd numbers get bigger. So thirteen uh, will become forty because thirteen times three is thirty-nine. Add one, you get forty. So it's a simple process for odd numbers and even numbers. They're both very easy operations, and then you put them together. It's still reasonably simple. Um, but then you, you ask what happens when you iterate it. You, you take the output that you just got and feed it back in. So 13 becomes 40. 40 is now even. Divide by 2 is 20. 20 is still even. Divide by 2, 10. 5, and then 5 times 3 plus 1 is 16. And then 8, 4, 2, 1. So, uh, and then from 1, it goes 1, 4, 2, 1, 4, 2, 1. It cycles forever. So the sequence I just described, um, you know, 13, 40, 20, 10, so forth, uh, these are also called hailstone sequences because there's an oversimplified model of, of hailstone formation, you know, which is not actually quite correct, but it's still somehow taught to high school students as a first approximation. Is that um, like a, a little nugget of ice gets, gets uh, an ice crystal it forms in, in a cloud and it goes up and down because of the wind. And, and sometimes when it's cold, it, it acquires a bit more mass and maybe it, it melts a little bit. And this process of going up and down creates this sort of partially melted ice, which eventually creates this hailstone. And eventually it falls out the earth. So the conjecture is that no matter how high you start up, like you take a number which is in the millions or billions, you have this process that, that goes up if you're odd and, and down if you're even, it eventually um, goes down to, to, to Earth all the time. No matter where you start with this very simple algorithm, you end up at one. Right. And you might climb for a while. Right. Yeah, so it's, down. It, yeah, if you plot it, um, these sequences, they look like Brownian motion. Um, they look like the stock market. You know, they just go up and down in a, in a seemingly random pattern. And in fact, usually that's what happens, that, that if you plug in a random number, you can actually prove, at least initially, that it would look like um, a random walk. Um, and that's actually a random walk with um, a downward drift. Um, it's like if you're always gambling on, on a roulette at, at the casino with odds slightly weighted against you. So sometimes you, you win, sometimes you lose, but over in the long run, you lose a bit more than you win. Um, and so normally your wallet will, hit, will go to zero um, if you just keep playing over and over again. So statistically, it makes sense. Yes. Yeah. So, so the result that I, I proved, roughly speaking, asserts that, that statistically, like 99% of all inputs would, would drift down to, maybe not all the way to one, but to be much, much smaller than what you started. So it's, it's like if I told you that if you go to a casino, most of the time you end up, if you keep playing for long enough, you end up with a smaller amount in your wallet than when you started. Um, that's kind of like the, what, the result that I proved. So why is that result, like, can you continue down that thread to prove the full conjecture? Well, the, the problem is that um, my, I, I used arguments from probability theory, um, and there's always this exceptional event. So, you know, so in probability, we have this, this law of large numbers, um, which tells you things like if you play a casino with a, um, a game at a casino with a losing um, expectation, over time, you are guaranteed, well, almost surely, you know, with Probably, probability as close to 100% as you wish, you're guaranteed to lose money. But there's always this exceptional outlier. Like, it is mathematically possible that even in, in the game is, is the odds are not in your favor, you could just keep winning slightly more often than you lose. Very much like how in Navier Stokes, it could be, you know, um, most of the time um, your waves can disperse. There could be just one outlier choice of initial conditions that would lead you to blow up. And there could be one outlier choice of, um, um, a special number that you, that you stick in that shoots off to infinity while all other numbers crash to earth, uh, crash to one. Yeah. Um, in fact, um, there's some mathematicians that, um, who've, uh, Alex Kontorovich, for instance, who've proposed that um, that actually um, these collapse uh, iterations are like these cellular automata. 
Um, uh, yeah, you can actually, if, if you look at what they happen on, on, in binary, they do actually look a little bit like like these game of life type patterns. Mm-hmm. You, um, and in an analogy to how the game of life can create these these massive like self replicating objects and so forth, possibly you could create some sort of heavier than air flying machine, you know, a, a number which is actually encoding this machine, which is just whose job it is is to encode is to create a, a, a version of itself which is, which is larger. Heavier than air machine encoded in a number yeah. that flies forever. Yeah. So Conway, in fact, worked on, worked on this problem as well. Oh wow. So Conway, uh, so similar. In fact, uh, uh, that was more of inspirations for the Navier Stokes project. That uh, Conway studied generalizations of the collapse problem, where instead of multiplying by three and adding one or dividing by two, you, you have a more complicated branching rules. But but instead of having two cases, maybe you have seventeen cases, and then you go up and down. And he showed that once your iteration gets complicated enough, you can actually encode Turing machines and you can actually make these problems undecidable and, and do things like this. In fact, he invented a programming language for uh, these kind of fractional linear transformations. He called a Factrat as a play on, on Fortrat. Uh, and he showed that, that you, you, can, um, you, you can program it was Turing complete. You could, you could, you could, uh, um, you could make a program that if, if your number you insert in was encoded as a prime, it would sink to zero. It would go down, otherwise it would go up, uh, and things like that. Um, so th- the general class of problems is, is really uh, as complicated as all the mathematics. Some of the mystery of the cellular automata that we talked about, uh, having a fr- mathematical framework to say anything about cellular automata, maybe the same kind of framework is required yeah, yeah. Clock's injector. Yeah, if you want to do it not statistically, but you really want one hundred percent of all inputs to to for the Earth. Yeah. So what might be feasible is is yeah, statistically ninety nine percent. You know, going yeah. to go to one, but to, to, like everything, yeah, uh, that looks hard. What would you say is out of these within reach famous problems is the hardest problem we have today? Is the Riemann hypothesis? Riemann is up there. Um, P equals MP is, is a good one because, like, uh, that's a that's a meta problem. Like, if you solve that in the um, in the positive sense that you can find a P equals MP algorithm, then potentially this solves a lot of other problems as well. 